speaker. Uh, next we'll have Dr. Uh, Anna Weil, um, who is currently the assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at, uh, at UW, uh, University of Washington. Um, yeah, feel free to, to share your screen. Um, she did her, uh, after her undergraduate work at uh, University of California, Berkeley, she did a Master of Public Health at Johns Hopkins and uh, earned, earned that degree in 2009. Um, then she moved to uh, earn her medical doctorate at Tufts University, um, uh, after which she did a residency uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital in internal medicine uh, in 2013, moving on and completing her fellowship in infectious disease uh, in 2015, and then um, uh, she entered the position of a physician scientist um, until moving her lab uh, to, to, to Seattle, so our area, neck of the woods. So um, we're very happy to hear your talk. Um, her research focuses on generally uh, enteric diseases and uh, gut microbes and how they interact with like Vibrio coli uh, pathogenesis and um, understanding how these gut microbes uh, modify immune responses and uh, especially as it concerns oral vaccines. And her talk today will be the gut microbiota and uh, immune response to oral vaccination. So. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. Uh, um, Thank you again for the invitation. I'm Anna Weil. I'm a physician scientist here at the University of Washington, and my lab is in the Center for Emerging and Reemerging Infectious Diseases. So I'm going to be talking today about um, kind of our pipeline going from human samples all the way to studying some of the interactions, uh, both between the host and the pathogen and also between uh, gut microbes and the pathogen. Uh, so I'll start uh, with a little bit of background about cholera. Um, it's kind of thought of as a as an ancient disease, but still occurs in many parts of the world. Uh, I'll move on to demonstrate our approach to research questions using an example from our human studies of susceptibility to infection, and move on to talk about the um, effect of the gut microbes on what we think of the immune response uh, to oral cholera vaccines. So in the last few decades, there has been a resurgence of Vibrio cholera infection and cholera outbreaks of increasing size and scope. Uh, in more than 50 countries, there is year-round transmission of cholera, uh, primarily in countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. There are many factors that contribute to this, but the most important one is the provision of modern sanitation. There's still a billion people that live without um, access to safe water, and uh, if that problem was solved tomorrow, there wouldn't be any cholera anymore. Uh, but we seem as a, as a society to be unable to provide this, so cholera continues on. Um, warming ocean surface temperatures also contribute to an expanding um, area where Vibrio cholera can live in the ocean, uh, where it has its natural habitat. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to show a case, since um, many of you probably haven't seen cholera, and because as a physician scientist, I feel uh, I need to represent the, uh, the um, public health impact on an individual basis. So this is a published case report of a cholera patient at the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research. This is the center where uh, our, all of the human cohorts are, where um, I'll be showing you data from these today. So this is a patient presenting to this hospital, which is a large hospital, as well as research center for diarrheal diseases. You can see that this patient has a decreased level of consciousness and kind of sunken eyes is obviously not looking well. Uh, presenting here to the hospital after six hours of vomiting and diarrhea. On the right side is a picture of that diarrhea. It doesn't even really look like stool because it's not brown, uh, and which really exemplifies what happens in um, cholera, which is that all the fluid from your body, you know, is leaving your body uh, in large amounts. <clears throat> so this patient looked like this after just six hours of rehydration. Uh, antibiotics are also used to treat cholera, but they are not essential. Uh, the main treatment is really just support of rehydration during that time when Vibrio cholera is bound to the gut epithelium and is making cholera toxin, which is producing this diarrhea. But once the epithelium is um, shed, then the infection runs its course, which can be usually a short illness, but people just need support through that time. 
So it's using patients like this, uh, where we have uh, studied these human cohorts of cholera patients um, and are now looking into the microbiome. So uh, this is the front of the main hospital. Uh, I spent a year here as a medical student working in the laboratory of Dr. Ferdowsi Kadri, who is an expert in vibrio cholera immunology. Um, in this study, we were looking at household contacts of cholera patients. So uh, this is the essentially the study design of all of the cases I'll be talking through. But we enroll a household case as they come into the hospital on day zero, uh, enroll them into the study, enroll their household contacts, since we presume that there's a shared exposure to Vibrio cholera, either through a shared water source in the household or community or through person-to-person -person contact. So at that time of enrollment, we ask questions about their symptoms during the previous week and then follow them prospectively uh, to see if they're shedding Vibrio cholera. So are they infected or not? But this time point is really unique in, um, in microbiome studies, especially of infectious disease, because we have this point of exposure before people develop infection. So from this time point, when we enroll the household contacts, going forward in time, we can see, do they become infected or do they remain uninfected? And that's the comparison we'll be, we'll be talking about. Additionally, there are many household contacts and people who develop cholera, in, you know, vibrio cholera infection, but actually don't develop any symptoms. And we're also interested in the microbiota that um, might help protect people from symptoms, as well as those that may protect from infection. So to uh, discuss how we think the microbiome might be impacting vibrio cholera pathogenesis, I wanna just talk about a few of the virulence factors that are critical in this infection. So uh, pathogens are ingested through contaminated water uh, and in the small intestine, they colonize in that area. This is different from C. diff, which you've been talking about a lot at the symposium, uh, which uh, acts in the large intestine. So motility through the small intestinal mucus is one of the main virulence factors. Uh, then uh, there are two major ones that occur that are expressed right at the epithelial surface, and that's the toxin coregulated pilus, which is a colonization factor, and then cholera toxin that actually mediates uh, the diarrhea through the mechanism shown on the right here in this figure. Uh, then once there's a group of vibrio cholera at the surface, biofilm is produced to protect the group from detaching from the epithelium and from the effects of luminal flow in the small intestine. But when these bacteria signal to each other that there's a large amount of them through quorum sensing and environmental signals, they stop expressing virulence factors, detach from the epithelium, and go back out into the environment to infect other people. Uh, and this figure was made by Denise Chak, a postdoctoral researcher in my group who is responsible for much of the work I'll be talking about. So we first looked at susceptibility to Vibrio cholera in household contacts, first uh, using 16S sequencing. This was the very first study a number of years ago. Uh, and we used a support vector machine learning model to uh, identify OTUs that were most associated with developing infection versus remaining uninfected. Uh, and we used a testing and training um, data set, as you saw in the last talk. Uh, this here results are shown as a holdout validation where we uh, create this prediction on one set of household contacts and then test it on another. And what we found was that the microbiota measured here by OTUs um, predicted the outcome, whether a person became infected or remained uninfected better than the clinical risk factors that we know exist for developing infection. Uh, as you can see here, the clinical risk factors don't predict infection very well, uh, since the line is pretty close to the kind of 50-50 of how well that prediction was made. Uh, and those clinical risk factors are age, um, blood group, and previous exposure to Vibrio cholera. So based on this, we want to delve deeper into, you know, which, what, you know, more specifically, what genes and what species and strains might be responsible for this effect. Uh, so we next used a larger cohort of household contacts and conducted metagenomic. Uh, this time machine learning was done with random forests uh, and a few other tools. And our goal in this setting was to identify the discriminating species uh, that were associated with infection versus protection, and also those that were associated with symptomatic disease versus asymptomatic disease. Uh, and again, this is a deep dive, you know, really, but it's all correlations between uh, a clinical outcome and the microbiota. These are correlative data that, um, you know, could be other markers for other things about the host uh, or about, um, 
the immune system response to the pathogen or something related to direct competition. You know, at this point, we really were trying to delve deeper to understand what strains to test in vitro. Uh, and we were able to achieve that with this analysis. So um, since this is kind of an example of our approach, I'm just gonna go quickly on this one slide through uh, the next steps we used and one of the conclusions we reached. And this is about the virulence factor biofilm production. So one of the highly ranked species we saw was called Paracoccus aminovorans. This is a soil microbe that uh, is not very well, uh, was not very well known. Uh, it was present in the microbiota of people living really only in lower income countries. Uh, and when we screen this microbe with Vibrio cholera in vitro for in changes in cholera toxin production or toxin correlated pilus production, we found that in the presence of paracoccus, Vibrio cholera made much more biofilm. And this was unique because paracoccus on its own didn't make any biofilm. Uh, and what we found by examining these further uh, was that there was a lot of Vibrio cholera in this pellicle, which is the top part of the biofilm. And much, uh, and and but not really any difference in the amount of Vibrio cholera growing in the planktonic part of the culture. Uh, we tested this effect using um, mutants for different aspects of biofilm production, and we found that this effect was VPSL dependent. VPSL is uh, the gene that encodes um, the extracellular matrix production of biofilm, so it's the main infrastructure piece uh, of the Vibrio cholera biofilm. So somehow this this presence of paracoccus was resulting in, uh, was dependent upon um, the VPSL production. So we then, uh, with collaborators at Tufts University, um, colonized mice with paracoccus, uh, made sure that we were not ablating the microbiota of these mice with paracoccus, but that we were really adding it to the what was in the, the current milieu of those mice, and then uh, tested to see if there was a difference in host colonization. And we found that there was, and that this was also VPSL dependent whether we infected the mice with paracoccus ahead of time uh, as a pre-colonization step, or if we um, colonized them with Vibrio cholera and paracoccus at the same time. Using RNA-seq from co- and monocultures, we found that there was much more VPSL production uh, when paracoccus was present. And then using imaging with a collaborator, um, Jin Yang at Yale University, we found that these two microbes really were coexisting within the biofilm, which was the first time this had been observed in Vibrio cholera, and that this might have a clinical um, clinical importance in increasing host colonization. So uh, this is just an example of how we aim to use human data and metagenomics to essentially identify bacterial species or strains or genes uh, that we can then test in vitro and in models. Uh, and we aim to do this using strains isolated from the study population. Uh, the goal of this work ultimately is to identify bacterial candidates or their metabolites that decrease Vibrio cholera virulence rather than increase, uh, such that these can be used in the form of a probiotic, for example, um, as a prophylactic in a high-risk setting, such as in those households where people are um, exposed to Vibrio cholera and have that high risk after the initial case in their household, or in places like refugee camps where achieving something as simple as clean water might be uh, not possible in the short term. Um, and so uh, this arm of the work in my lab is continuing continuing forward, but I'm gonna switch gears to talk about how we've applied this approach to the gut microbiota and oral cholera vaccines. Uh, so the World Health Organization uh, has been focused on cholera control and reducing this 90% um, by the year 2030. Uh, this has been um, not achieved, I'll say, unfortunately, uh, for many reasons. Uh, and uh, the path to 2030 is not looking super uh, likely at this point, uh, but one of the main tools in the toolbox for reducing cholera cases is the use of oral cholera vaccines. So we chose to study this partly because oral cholera vaccines have very limited efficacy in very vulnerable groups, especially in children, which make up half of cholera deaths. And also the protection, the duration of protection is quite short. Um, so the questions we were asking ourselves in these studies first was, is there a relationship at all between the gut microbiota and immune responses to oral cholera vaccines? And then are there any strains or metabolites that could boost vaccine responses? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, vaccine efficacy is limited, um, but also there's kind of a bigger picture question about how the gut microbiota may impact 
immune responses to oral vaccines and vaccine efficacy. It's been observed in many trials of oral vaccines, especially in children, that these vaccines can have great immune responses and even great efficacy when they're tested uh, in mostly Western countries. But then when field trials are done in the countries where these vaccines are needed, the vaccine efficacy is lower and the immune responses to vaccination is lower. And it's not really known why this is. Uh, it could be diet. It could be you know the confounding effects of malnutrition and other parts of the environment. But the gut microbiota and differences in this is, a, is one main um, proposed reason. So the study design here is similar to what I mentioned before. These are patients from the ICDDRB who had have not had antibiotics in the previous two weeks, do not have diarrhea and have not had prior oral cholera vaccines. They get two doses of the WHO approved and currently uh, the vaccine that makes up the WHO stockpile for emergencies, which is a killed whole cell inactivated formulation. And then we collect um, their immune responses after this. And this is again in partnership with Dr. Ferdowsi Kadri at the ICDDRB and our partners at Mass General. So the immune correlate we're going to use to discuss the results is the memory B cell specific to the O specific polysaccharide of the Vibrio cholera LPS. It's a mouthful, but just to say this is the marker of immunity uh, that seems to be most closely linked to protection. Uh, antibodies to the O specific polysaccharide. Um, bind to the uh, flagellum of Vibrio cholera and decrease motility. And this seems to be the mechanism of protection, although uh, this is a newer discovery and it's somewhat debated still what is the correct correlate of immunity um, for these studies. <clears throat> so uh, we found that the gut microbiota at the time of vaccination, we're looking for so this day zero stool, did have a relationship with the OSB specific memory B cell responses. Uh, this so what we did here was really split our vaccine vaccinees into groups of responders and non-responders, and then compare the gut microbiota between those groups. What we found was that there were specific gut microbial profiles that were from people more likely to respond, but these were overlapping groups, as you can see in this PCOA. This was um, work done by Denise, uh, who I mentioned previously. Um, this you know obviously overlapping groups, and there's a lot of more to. Uh, to tease out here. So we started by using fecal extracts from responders and non-responders and comparing the response of stimulation with these fecal extracts in THP1-derived human macrophages and cell culture. Uh, we use this model because this is a, a model we previously created and validated for studying innate immune responses to Vibrio cholera uh, vaccines. And the reason we study innate responses is because we know that um, the innate response to infection or to vaccination seems to be critical in um, generating and maintaining those memory B cells that uh, provide the long-term protection. So uh, we studied a range of innate immune cytokines in this study. Um, I'm just showing two here. IL-6 and IL-1 beta are canonical innate immune cytokines. Usually they're co-regulated, but what we found was that they uh, were different in responders and non-responders, but in different directions. So this was surprising, but was enough for us to take the next step um, to try to tease these relationships out with a lot more precision. So uh, what we did next was um, use a larger cohort, again, of, um, of vaccine vaccinees using metagenomics. Um, we did a analysis to essentially try to identify specific genes from the full metagenomic data set that were associated with the clinical outcome. And we did this using a co-abundant gene analysis. So uh, this type of analysis uh, we worked with Sam Minot from the Fred Hutch, who designed this method. He's a, a, a has a lot of expertise in metagenomic methods, and a student in my lab, a medical student, um, Fred Heller, uh, spent a year uh, working through this computational data and making sense of these coabundant gene groups. Uh, so these are groups of genes associated with an outcome. And these we mapped back onto the reference genomes from this data set. So Fred's uh, work was really focused on translating these CAGs that were highly linked to our immune response and translating this back um, to understand which 
bacterial strains specifically had the most of these CAGs and that, that we should weight with the most importance and then test in vitro. So to do this, he created a priority score to quantify the strength of the association between the CAGs and the bacterial genome. Um, oops, we're jumping ahead. So uh, to do this, th there's a big equation that includes all of these aspects that I'm not showing, but I'm happy to show it if anyone's interested. Uh, but essentially, the score is independent of CAG size, since smaller CAGs are more likely to map to genomes than large ones. Uh, this score accounts for the number of CAGs mapping to each genome and then discriminates between strains uh, within one species. So using this data, uh, we again created a list of candidate strains this time that were uh, of the most interest to us. And I just want to illustrate one thing about that analysis. Um, the priority scores here are shown in this tree on the right side with the black, I keep jumping ahead for some reason, are, are the black ones with the, um, are next to the, the uh, strain name were the ones with the highest priority score. So what we found was that if you can see here in B theta is a good example where this strain was highly linked to the clinical outcome, but the next few that are obviously the same species were not as closely linked. So. I kind of tried to quantify this in this table by showing the proportion of, of strains within these species that were highly ranked. So this is just to illustrate that these uh, correlations and identifications of um, highly ranked CAGs were very strain specific. So when we're isolating bacteroides from the study population, it was important that we identify strains that had these specific genes of interest. So getting back to our results, um, we basically found that those most highly ranked species here, this is a summary of the species that had strains that were most highly ranked, um, were often uh, genera that were associated with producing sphingolipids. This was a surprise to us because most um, bacteria don't make sphingolipids. Sphingolipids are ubiquitously created by eukaryotes, but they're only made by a few bacterial genera. Um, and the gene that we first kind of validated these results with was the serine palmitoyl transferase gene, uh, a gene required for de novo synthesis of sphingolipids by bacteria. So we went back to the entire metagenomic data set and looked at the SPT gene content that was, you know, strain independent between responders and non responders and found that there was. Uh, a difference. Uh, and with this, we decided to take some next steps first to try to identify which lipids might be um, effector molecules potentially in this in this uh, situation. So uh, we first conducted lipidomics on, on the stool from vaccine responders and non-responders. Uh, we did this at the Northwest Metabolomics Research Center. And in this analysis, we found some lipids that were highly uh, correlated with response that were not, um, it was not possible to determine if those were human derived or bacterial derived or plant derived from diet, et cetera. Uh, but we really focused on some of these sphingolipids and ceramides that we found, um, which made up a lot of the hits of uh, the lipids that were more likely to be found in vaccine responders. Um, just a little bit of background about sphingolipids is that importantly, uh, bacterial derived sphingolipids are possible to be distinguished from eukaryotic sphingolipids. And this was important for us, you know, in studying these in vitro to understand um, that we could identify potentially molecules from bacteria and not just from the host. So microbes produced odd numbered and branched sphingolipids, uh, and there are specific inhibitors that exist to inhibit um, the steps of synthesis of these um, sphingolipids in bacteria, which was also critical for our in vitro assays. So we next took um, strains that were isolated from the study population. Uh, most of the strains were isolated by Chelsea Dunmire, who spent over a year really just isolating bacteria and identifying them from the study population. Uh, and just to talk about um, briefly a few of those strains, one SPT positive strain of Bacteroides zelani solvens and another B. Frage. Um, we worked with Libin Zhu from the Department of Mis Medicinal Chemistry here to examine what specific ceramides and sphingolipids were made in the supernatant of these microbes. And we found that there were several candidate species um, that were made by these bacteria compared to controls such as um, SPT negative Bacteroides. 
Um, so we, you know, we are continuing on this path of examining the specific lipids that may be responsible uh, for some of the effects that we've seen. Um, and at this time, we also kind of shifted to look more at what models we could use to test those eventual effector models and these bacterial strains. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we have a model for testing any immune responses to oral cholera vaccines. I just have a schematic of how we use this here. Um, this model we initially created to test um, vaccine strain versus natural infection uh, strains of vibrio cholera as a model to understand the differences between vaccine uh, induced immunity and natural infection. This model is um, macrophage based, which, which is a primary innate immune cell in the lamina propria level, um, just under the epithelium that provides much of the innate immune response to infection. From this cell culture model, after stimulating with the antigen of your choice or sphingolipids, um, this can be used for amino assays and then also for um, further molecular work and um, sequencing. We do um, assess a lot of gene transcripts from, from these models. So what we next uh, performed, and this is uh, work by Denise, was to separate out the lipids from these um, monocultures of Bacteroides species uh, and used in this process myriacin, which is an inhibitor of that SPT gene. So here we could examine you know, whole cell lysates as well as the metabolites made by these bacteria, uh, some of the debris and cell membrane components, and then compare these to um, lipids, including sphingolipids from these bacteria, or uh, the lipid fraction without sphingolipids. So what we found was that in the presence of um, sphingolipids, I'll skip through um, the metabolites and cell membrane, which do not have many differences, uh, to the lipid fraction. This is of Bacteroides zeleni solvens that we did find that when the sphingolipids were not present, there was much more of this innate immune um, effect in some of these cytokine responses. Um, so at that point, we wanted to test how the effect of these lipids might impact the immune response to vaccination, which is our ultimate goal in this work is to understand um, how uh, bacteria or its metabolite might help to boost vaccine responses. So we then tested um, the model using sphingolipids with the strain JBK70, which is a vaccine strain. Uh, it's a vibrio cholera strain that doesn't have any cholera toxin, and it's analogous to the strain that's in the vaccine stockpile currently. Again, we saw when we pre-treated uh, the cells with sphingolipids that there was less inflammation um, compared to when we, these were not pre-treated, but that Somewhat paradoxically, uh, with less inflammation present prior to vaccination, once we stimulated with the vaccine strain, there was a much greater vaccine response. So this was in agreement with the human data that we originally were assessing, but it was surprising. Um, we thought initially we would see that sphingolipids might be inflammatory and cause a response uh, in the cells that was like an adjuvant, you know, causing inflammation and priming the innate immune response so such that it could be even greater when an antigen was introduced. But what we saw was actually the opposite, that sphingolipids seem to reduce baseline inflammation, but then somehow mediate an increased innate immune response to those vaccine antigens. So we learned since that this is a paradigm seen in some other vaccines where having a lower uh, baseline inflammation can allow a greater immune response to antigen. So this is our working hypothesis right now. So in summary, we found that uh, in fecal samples that there are, there's, there are different lipid species present in different abundances between vaccine responders and non-responders, and that there is um, a difference in um, specifically IL-6 when we stimulate uh, host um, or human macrophages with these fecal extracts, and that when we identify the spe specific species that make these sphingolipids and confirm that these produce sphingolipids of interest, uh, in this model, we found that these also reduce innate immune cytokines and also increase responses to the OCB vaccine strain. So our next steps uh, are to look into other bacterial groups uh, and understand more about which effector molecule and also to profile the innate immune response more thoroughly than only macrophages. 
And one of the ways that Denise is working on doing that right now is by integrating our macrophage model with probably a duodenal enteroid uh, intestinal epithelial layer, or we could use also cell culture of intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, and these, this work is ongoing to understand more about um, both uh, what part of sphingolipids is causing this interaction, what innate immune pathway uh, is involved and how this might be operationalized further for use in humans. So I'm not sure why my slides were skipping around a lot, so sorry about that. Um, something must be off of the timings on this, uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, but quickly, I wanted to acknowledge in my lab, Denise Chak uh, and others I mentioned here, um, those at Mass General and the ICDDRB who are responsible for the initiation and maintenance of many of these cohorts, Sam Minot at Fred Hutch, um, at the University of Montreal, Jesse Shapiro and his group who we worked on our initial studies with, um, Libin Zhu in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Wei Liang Ng at Tufts who does um, the mouse work in the um, pathogen interaction with the gut microbes I mentioned and those at the Northwest Metabolomics Research Center. And with that, thank you. Um, I look forward to the panel and any of your questions and please evaluate my talk with this QR code if you can. Thank you.